Great. So I'm really happy to introduce very briefly uh, David Hugh, who is going to tell us uh, more about his life history, and I'm really excited to hear about it. So David, please take it away. Great. Thanks, or thanks everyone for coming. Um, it's been really humbling to see all these talks. Um, uh, I mean, seeing this whole series and have it now on YouTube, it's such a great resource. So I'm happy to have the privilege to try to contribute to this. So I thought we'd start this talk with a half naked uh, middle aged man wearing spandex and spray painted gray. Can you all see that? <laughs> so I thought this first image is a pretty good picture of what um, my life was like and still is kind of like basically I'm holding two kids. Um, that's my wife. And without without her support, there's no way I could have been doing any of this stuff. Um, we've got two human spotlights in the background. They're the basically the Ignimo prize sort of props. They go around you and make sure you're spotlighted. <laughs> but it's hard not to not to look at all their parts and stuff like that. So I've got three takeaways um, in case that some of you are going to peace out after one minute of this talk. In your research career, you got to be ready for surprises and grasp hold of them when you can, just like these human spotlights. For me, um, every researcher has got um, a trick up their sleeve, something that doesn't other people don't have. And for me, it's the visuals. Like I've obsessed about the visuals, I've thought about them, and ultimately, I, they're a lot of what I'm going to remember my career when I retire. Um, the, uh, the next, uh, what is, uh, I guess I can't move this. Okay. The next thing is one thing I've realized from watching all these talks and just going over my life is that, um, I wouldn't have been anywhere without these great students. Um, you know, the, the students that will push your careers are not necessarily always the smartest students, um, but they are going to be the most passionate ones, the ones that just stick with it and, uh, just really love science. And um, it's our job to find who they are and uh, try to try to get them to stay. Um, so on me, that's that's our right side lab picture, the um, human human uh, pyramid that we do every year. I'm getting old. I could not climb the human pyramid, <laughs> but the, my grad students, Hong Tong and and um, Andrew, they're all they're all down there and Seth. All right. So uh, first, I got to thank my parents. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people grow up without scientists around them, but my parents actually both have PhDs in chemistry. Um, so from a very early age, they were saying words like polymers and nylon and molecular formulas, and they had glass speakers throughout the house. And uh, I mean, from the very beginning, I thought science and every diet life were just mixed together. There was no separation between the two. And uh, they've always encouraged me. And even though I didn't accomplish their dream of going to medical school, I, mean, I got into medical school, but I didn't go. Um, they were still supportive. So um, I grew up in Maryland. Um, Suburban Maryland has some great schools. Um, uh, in sixth grade, we had this special sort of magnet program. Um, Marilyn Schumann, she was the teacher there. Um, she actually really believed in her students. Um, so I was in sixth grade. I was 11, and she asked us to spend eight weeks writing a book. So. I decided to write about 4,000 years of history of China in a book that was about 80 pages. Um, and it was the first time I actually had to sort of put a story together from basically like all the history and like the visuals. And um, those are my drawings. And those are my kids actually reading my book. Um, I'm, it's, it's amazing that, that this thing can still sort of test the time, at least in my household. Um, what ultimately got me into college was this research experience with uh, Virgil Provenzano at Naval Research Laboratory. Um, this is where my dad had worked for many years and to send me to work, he had to carpool. I mean, basically had to drive almost three hours a day to do double carpool shift duty. Um, so I could work um, with his physicist on the, how material properties of metals change with basically uh, small pores in them. And what that does is it makes the materials have sort of higher energy of fracture because the pores cause cracks to go this corrugated route rather than the straight route. I had knew I knew not, absolutely nothing at the time. I'd barely taken physics and Virgil Provenzano just took, showed me how to do scanning electron microscopy and showed me how to give a talk and supported my whole college application process. 
There's this competition called Westinghouse, which is now um, has been changing names and things like that. But I was awarded this semi-finalist position, which um, sent, they sent a list to all the colleges. And that's pretty much the only reason I think uh, I got to my next step. And he also put me on a publication. There I am, last author on this publication back in 1997. And that was, I mean, that was a really big deal for me. So I guess the... Um, the after um, Naval Research Laboratory, I spent eight years at MIT, and um, MIT has this great program in mechanical engineering. Is that they assign every undergraduate student an advisor, so somebody that checks up on them, advises classes, and um, if you want to do research with them, uh, supports you. And uh, it was really good because I, in some ways, I found someone that um, really fit my interests in the math, in the mechanical engineering department. And that was this mathematician named Mahadevan. And I mean, half the people on this call are basically have gone through Mahadevan's lab. Um, so, I mean, he showed me that there's a whole job of doing research for fun. And there's a beauty in research that uh, this aesthetic value, this aesthetic appreciation, um, it's not always there in lots of sciences, but, but he, he showed it to me. So because of him, I applied to grad school um, and I stayed at MIT and John Bush was really, he's really my academic father. I mean, I did not believe in myself very much and he's believed in me. And uh, this water starter picture that you see is actually comes from what was actually my first homework assignment in his class to look at how these insects walk on water. Um, so, I mean, he taught me everything from how to publish a paper uh, to how to write grants, um, to how to sort of enjoy my research. And one thing learning about water starters is, hey, water starters are really photogenic. <laughs> I mean, look at all these nature covers. Little did I know at the time that those are really hard to get. <laughs> uh, and that one on the right, that's the cover of the textbook I taught with at Georgia Tech uh, with my research on the cover. So it was really, I mean, it was such, such a privilege to work with him and to work on that topic. So everything, I think after, after everyone's PhD, they have a turning point. They have to decide if they're going to sort of be a little version of their advisor or if they're going to step into the next, in the next path. And um, I went to NYU, uh, the Cron Institute, and I worked with Mike Shelley. And uh, Jasmine was actually my first undergrad, <laughs> Jasmine. And we took this photo together of um, snake moving on photoelastic gelatin. And uh, this topic was... It was really good for me because at the time I didn't have confidence that I could work on something outside of these insects walking in the water. I mean, it basically I had to formulate this whole research problem. I mean, Jasmine and I were chasing snakes around the lab through the printers and uh, we had to sort of try to understand this very old biological problem of how they can move on smooth surfaces. So Mike taught me that it's, you branch out, miraculous things can happen. and. Um, that sort of gave me, I felt like, a license to go do other things. Um, so after NYU, I ended up in Georgia Tech, um, which is a huge engineering school. And um, a lot of assistant professors will tell you their first year as an assistant professor is, is a little bit, you kind of have to find yourself. And uh, I kind of thought I was going to just be an engineer. So I wrote papers. I mean, I had a great uh, master student, Will Hobbs, who wrote this paper, Tree Inspired Piezoelectric Energy Harvesting. And um, this is actually a very well-cited paper. Um, but uh, at the same year, I was also trying to figure out who I really am. And I published stuff like this, The Growth of Giant Pumpkins, <laughs> How Extreme Weight Influences Shape. Uh, and uh, I took pictures. I went through the fairgrounds and took pictures of these giant pumpkins. And uh, so I decided, am I going to write grants on piezoelectric energy harvesting? Or I'm going to the fairgrounds and take pictures of these pumpkins, even though no one's ever going to fund this. And I, to be honest, I still deal with that dilemma every single day. Um, but these are both papers came out the same year. So you can imagine what a confused assistant professor I was and what a hard job my letter writers had to write when they had to summarize my research career for the next stage. I mean, what the heck? <laughs> so what helped me find my path was uh, finding some really great students. Um, and that allowed me to start some research projects that I would not have not have been able to do. So um, this is Nathan Mallott. Um, 
he's in energy industry now, but um, he had great passion for ants. And we learned about how fire ants can build these rafts together. And, um, and uh, he really built this ant lab, this all these procedures to study these things. And um, so finding the students and figuring out what they were good at really helped me sort of direct my interests. I gotta, I guess I'm in 1030. I better finish up soon. Um, so about, um, we talked about in the last talk, we heard a little about the dark side of uh, career progressing. I mean, for me, uh, it was facing um, uh, politics. So maybe some of you heard, but um, for many years, um, the Republicans have been publishing these works, these waste books. And uh, one year in 2016, um, th I thank goodness, I think I already had gotten tenure by then. Um, I was awarded the most wasteful scientist award for, for doing three of the most wasteful studies out of the entire year. Um, so it was actually one of the worst days of my life watching this on national TV. And uh, just every time someone said to me, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry you're on the waste book. I mean, it was a... It was a huge, huge crushing um, defeat to be on the waste book. Um, but it was nice. I did summarize all my thoughts in this article that Georgia Tech gave me 24 hours to write to defend myself. And uh, Jeff Flake, it made me realize that a lot of these attacks on science, they're really, they really don't have um, much science behind them. I mean, he basically said, oh, yeah, thanks for your thoughtful response. And um, you're basically off the hook. Hey, but can you help join me and help me find the really wasteful people? Um, so I maybe I'll do that, but uh, not not this year. So um, since I've been on the waste book, um, one of the things that I I did as an associate professor was um, start to write books. Um, this is my first book, um, How to Walk in Water and Climb Up Walls. Um, this is me pre-COVID, giving basically giving five hundred free signed copies of the book to a Society of Rheumatologists and at a science museum, um, giving it to 10-year-olds. Uh, and it was such a wonderful journal, journal writing books. Um, if any of you are interested in doing it, you should just grab the opportunity and do it before your senses come to you. So um, I'll end with this picture of the ant tail end of a wombat. These are wombat feces. They're cubic. Um, uh, be ready for surprises. Obsess about your visuals. Um, and remember, this is a living history talk. We, the speakers, we're the past, the future are the students. But thanks very much. Happy to open the floor for questions. Thank you so much, David. That was wonderful. Uh, I think uh, I'm clapping in the, on behalf of everybody. Um, and uh, if, um, does anybody have any questions, um, comments? Uh, I can I can maybe start unless I'm, am I no okay so I'll I'll start with one question I um I always wanted to ask you which is um so it seems like you're um working on a really different variety of model systems um and um, if I interpret it correctly it's sort of curiosity driven science uh, at least in part or maybe in whole um and so I'm just wondering um. How do you um, find time for new for new projects? I know that some people always reserve some free time just in case they come across a really cool problem. Some people just wing it, and I don't know if you have any wisdom to share about that. That would be interesting to know. Um, undergraduate researcher undergraduate researchers are the secret to getting crazy projects to work, um, because mm -hmm. like you, they are not really. I mean, they don't not going to be invested very much. And um, you can tell a lot about a project, even if an undergrad's working on it, within the first six months or a year. Um, uh, and a lot of the really great ones I'll have, like this wombat poop one, I think we might have worked on this for five, six years through various, through maybe yeah. 10 or 15 undergrads and uh, two, graduate, two graduate students and uh, finally external collaborators. Um, it takes, so uh, yeah, I spend like an inordinate amount of time, like basically massaging these projects. Um, I mean, yeah, it's definitely not the best way to run the lab, but 
definitely. But um, I mean, I I just uh, I just get this feeling that this project could be really good. Um, and and but uh, I mean, often with new projects, you have to come up with a model system for for example, just this this disgusting wombat poop. Um, uh, I mean. We had to get the wombat poop, and then we had to get the intestines, and we had to do the test with the intestines, and then we had to do the mathematical models on the intestines, and all the histology, and all those steps are along the way that I didn't have any expertise in. So, I just sort of took it one step at a time, and uh, we had many failures and many failed parts that never appeared in the paper. Um, and uh, luckily, the many undergrads that worked on this, they all either went to grad school or I mean wrote them very nice letters. So I considered it kind of win-win. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're against like this sort of enemy, like this unproject, this project that you don't even know what it's going to give you, like this unstoppable army, you just want to bring a bunch of students and have them face the army head on, and uh, and uh, they'll eventually wear it down. All right, that yeah, that sounds like a good strategy. I see that uh, Noah had a question. Yeah, thanks. This was really fun. So I guess I'm I'm curious about what your experiences have been like getting curiosity driven projects funded <laughs> so you mentioned you know you you had this choice of like how am i going to write grants am i going to do it on this these more sort of mainstream questions or these more um you know fairgrounds style questions yeah yeah I'm just curious how you how you, you what your experience has been going about actually um at work well luckily we have academic freedom so, I mean, you're right, we do, we are able to work on whatever we want. It's just how are you going to pay for it? Um, so I think the one nice thing about curiosity is that the assistant professor world, like the world of assistant professors and the grants that they write and the program officers that fund them, they really reward curiosity. I mean, they can tell if you're interested in this project. Um, it's very difficult to hide that you're that you're not interested that that you're not interested in. So I mean, I end up. I mean, I don't think anyone enjoys writing grants, but uh, if it's about a topic that I'm actually really excited about, it it becomes more palatable. Um, so, and uh, the grant process is. I mean, for example, the assistant professors we have this nice career grant that's five years long, and you can do a lot of crazy projects in five years. Um, ones that even make program officers upset. Um, if it's a little bit too far. So I have pushed that barrier a little bit. Um, universities also have um, sort of sort of mini chairs and chaired funds, and I've gotten a lot of that. Um, I've got some things funded that way, but you know, a lot of your most fun projects are not the most expensive ones, actually. are stuff that basically you just sort of stuck with and didn't cost money, mat money materials money, but they just cost, took your sort of time and sort of just sort of stuck with it. So... You can do a lot of that without having very much money. I mean, that's the nice thing, at least about organismal biology and um, at least this field is it's not very expensive. You just need to sort of figure out a way to keep to keep the budget running. But um, this is a professor life really does pay for it really rewards curiosity and uh, science on the cheap. I think it's uh, there's one thing I learned from John Bush. Um, you you got to do science cheaply if you want to do something interesting, interesting stuff. All right, we have time for one more quick question from uh, Suraj, and then uh, we'll, we'll move on. Yeah, no, this is this is absolutely great, and and sort of thank thank you for the talk, and sort of continuing on what Noah just asked in your response to it. So, uh, do you, um, given that you said you know when you have when you ask questions. Uh, uh, which are primarily curiosity driven and you know things like uh, why wombat uh, poo is uh, cube cube shaped i mean that's that's extremely fascinating but do you ever get discouraged uh, when uh, when not ev not every other uh, scientist is as excited about the kind of work that you do and if you do then how do you sort of keep motivating yourself on a daily basis or or you don't have a problem and then and you're always perpetually excited and there's always um, great things to think about. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of uh, people from the public like Jeff Flake, who not number my number one fan, right? And uh, I mean, even the scientists, scientists, we're a competitive brunch. Like we always want to be the best and um, they'll, no matter how well you're doing, people are going to find some way to shoot you down and make you feel bad. So. I mean, I just don't listen to those people. 
you're always going to find them. And the more public you are, the more kind of crazy people you're going to run into. And luckily, I just listen to what kids say. So if I can explain my research to some 10 year old, and they're like, whoa, that's cool. I know they're telling the truth. So I try not to listen to listen to uh, people that are just saying negative stuff. But um, it is a big deal. I mean, it is a big thing. You have to train yourself. And um, I think uh, I think I asked Maha that exact question. I was like, what do you do with people that don't like what you do? You said, what do you care about them? Classic Maha. <laughs> uh, all right. With that, I think we should uh, move on. We're kind of running late, but I'll hand it over to Shri. Uh, thank you so much, David, again. And uh, 